Where did everybody go? There's so many more people here on Friday. I have my model back, though, so I feel like a, a real person uh, having that back. A um, couple of quick things, as usual, um, beginning today. Virus structure function applications, um, literature review, which I will be doing with Stephen Reichow, faculty in chemistry. That will be next term on Friday afternoons. Um, I posted this also on D2L, so you can take a look at it. It's by instructor approval only. So if you're interested in taking the class, please send me an email um, about that. Um, we will be giving preference to people who are taking the mutant viruses from hell lab. Um, also, if you're interested in this lab um, and you don't have the prerequisites, for some reason you're not able to sign up, also please send me an email and let me know if you're interested in taking this particular lab. The main thing that we're looking for in terms of prerequisites is that you have some kind of advanced lab experience. So that would be our microbiology lab, our cell biology lab, or potentially some research lab experience. So those are the kinds of things we're looking for there. If you've just had principles of biology or just some of the chemistry labs, it may be a little bit of a stretch. Um, but if you're interested, again, please send me an email. Let me know about that. The other one is um, what we have up here on the right-hand screen. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit about cloning today. <clears throat> The uh, monkey twins made by the method that developed Dolly um, in terms of cloning and why it's all about DNA and why I brought my model again today. But before we do that, I did want to do a quick review of some of the things that happened on Friday. What was that? What did we do on Friday? Um, I, my exams must be getting better. Whether you agree with this or not, I don't know. Um, but the high scores are getting closer and closer to 50. Uh, they do seem to be outliers. The high score on this one was 47, which I'm pretty impressed by. I'm not sure if I would have gotten 47 on my exam. Uh, and just because of that, these were, in fact, I think there was a 47, 46, and 45. These were kind of outliers, but 41 seemed to be what to me seemed like a, a really good score. So I'm normalizing to 41. Again, eight of you were that or above. And then you can just scale down from there. One way to look at where you stand so far, at least as far as exam grades are concerned, take those two normalizations, 44 for the first one, 41 for the second exam, add those together, that makes 85. Take your total score, divide it by that, and look at the percentages that I have in lecture one and also in the um, syllabus. Um, I don't have your scantrons. I will try and have them by Wednesday's lecture. There were a couple of questions that Lots and lots of people missed, so I wanted to go over those at least very briefly. Um, how many different enzymatic activities are required to repair a deaminated cytosine in DNA? It's a uracil DNA glycosylase, an endonuclease, a phosphodiesterase, a DNA polymerase, and a DNA ligase, which ends up being five. So these are the kinds of questions that I absolutely love to ask on exams, as you've probably noticed because it requires you to think about things and maybe write them down and, and put them together. So that's what I was looking for here. Um, few people actually asked me during the exam if I counted ligase, and I just said, is that an enzyme? And I would agree, yes, that is an enzyme. So another question that I wanted to mention, and again, this is pretty typical in terms of the kinds of questions that I like to ask. This was not something I talked about in class. This is something where I had hoped you could make an extension from what we talked about in class. So in eukaryotic cells, DNA repair takes pr place preferentially on actively transcribed DNA. What's the likely reason that this happens? Actually, we know why it happens. But again, I didn't talk about this in class. But if you think about it, transcription. What do you have with transcription? It's the RNA polymerase, particularly RNA polymerase 2. So what does RNA polymerase 2 have that none of the other RNA polymerases have? The C-terminal domain. And that C-terminal domain is where you would put things that you might need while you're transcribing, i.e. something that you want to use to repair DNA with. And so the DNA repair proteins are, in fact, bound to the C-terminal domain of RNA polymerase 2. And interestingly enough, some of these DNA repair proteins are actually part of TF2H that humongous additional transcription factor 
that comes in, helps with helicase, helps with phosphorylating the CTD, also contains subunits which are part of the DNA repair machinery. Um, so those come in with that particular, and I don't think Dr. Bartlett talked about that, did he? No. <laughs> Let's see some shaking heads here. So um, again, these are the kinds of things that I like. The other kinds of questions that I like are these that are trying to compare. Think about multiple different things that we talked about. Um, so which of the following is a similarity between mature ribosomal RNA and messenger RNA CAP2 formation? Um, the thing that is similar there is you have methylation on bases. So here, methylation on bases that you have in the CAP2, and specifically, again, CAP2 here, and modifications that you get on the riboses in ribosomal RNA. So these are, again, the kinds of questions which I love to ask, and unfortunately, most people seem to miss. So, um, and if you've gotten these questions, great, you're doing, you're doing wonderfully. And then another one of these um, questions, sort of comparison between two different subjects that we talked about, um, the role of the RNA in a snow RNP is most similar to the role of the RNA in which of those small nuclear RNAs. So the important thing here is specificity. Where do you have your specificity of splicing that you get in splicing? Where do you get that specificity from? That was the exam. I know, I've forgotten it already. <laughs> U1 and U2, because that's the beginning and the end of your intron, because of the base pairing interactions. So it's base pairing interactions. Where do you get the modifications in your ribosomal RNA? Where the snow RNAs bind through base pairing interactions. So which of these actually has base pairing interactions? It's the U1 SNRNP. I very carefully chose the large summing of the ribosome here. What if I put the small subunit of the ribosome? That would have been base pairing interactions for what? I know you're taking other midterms probably in the near future, so no. Ribosome binding site. The ribosome binding site is going to bind to the small subunit of the RNA. So again, base pairing interactions. So that's what I was really aiming at here. And then um, the last one that actually, I looked at the statistics for this. 10% of the people got this. Which, if you think there were five potential answers, that means people actually selected against this answer, which um, tells me I didn't do a very good job of explaining it. So when you need tmRNA is when you have a broken messenger RNA. What does a broken messenger RNA mean? It's been cut somehow. How do you cut a nucleotide chain? You have an endonuclease. So it's an endonuclease activity. If you had an exonuclease activity, that chews in, but almost all the exonucleases we've talked about so far are highly processive. They will just chew in at ends. Yes, in the back. Um, so I, I remember from the lecture that FD is uh, incorrect stuff for uh, livestock. Is there anything that you can do with that? Okay, so. Maybe I did say that. If I did say so, it was an incorrect statement because um, where's the stop code on at the top here? Is there a stop code on? No, there's no stop code on here. There is a stop code on in the tmRNA out here. But here, the ribosome has stalled, but it's stalled at a completely regular codon and you know, codon anti codon interaction here. So this is not a stop codon. Okay, so why is D incorrect? Yeah, so what, where do you see tmRNA? What kinds of organisms? Bacteria. Do bacteria have poly tails on their RNA? No. Other questions? So what is it that has caused the break? Something has caused the break. Something. So again, this is hopefully getting you to think about, OK, why do you have a broken RNA? Why would you have a broken RNA in the first place? Usually because some kind of endonuclease activity. Pardon? Yeah. 
Well, a nick, that's actually that's a great point. So a nick, if you're cutting a single stranded nucleotide chain, a nick is going to be what? That's an endonuclease activity. Okay, other questions on this. Again, I, for some reason, I was amazed when I look, because I look at the statistics for every question. I go, like, whoa. <laughs> um, which does make, remind me of one other thing. Um, there is one of you, and I won't mention your name, who got 30 more points, actually more than 30 more points on their second exam than the first exam, and I posted how she did that. Okay, that shows you at least part of the, who this person is. Um, between one exam to the next. So um, posted some ideas on how to do that kind of thing. Not that you know, the people are getting 40s are going to get 70s on the next exam, but. <laughs> okay, so there are more questions on the, on the exam at this point. Okay, so hopefully you can figure out grades and things. Please come find me in office hours. Um, you can also check my Google Calendar if you need to set up some extra office hours. Okay, so today I want to finish up talking about protein folding and then move on into what I think is the most exciting part of this course, which is regulation. And mostly transcriptional regulation, but we'll talk about translational regulation, some of the other regulatory aspects of how all of our DNA turns into us. But first, again, talking about these folding pathways, I sort of got started on this at the end of the lecture, like last week, oh, yeah, yeah, it was all a week ago, um, thinking about molten globules. So if you think about how proteins fold, proteins have to get from a linear stretch of amino acids that's made by the ribosome to a three-dimensional fold, and that gives you a structure which will give you a function. So, got to get there. How does that happen? Um, in many cases, not all of them, you have this intermediate called a molten globule, where you've got a lot of secondary structure, but not really good tertiary structure. And often, what happens with this is that you have this, all these secondary structures that can somehow end up with extra hydrophobic regions, so hydrophobic amino acids, sort of the, <coughs> excuse me, leucines, isoleucines, et cetera, hang out on the outside of the protein. And if that happens and they interact with other proteins, you end up with this big humongous mess and all of these aggregated proteins, and this is what seems to happen in things like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, a lot of neurodegenerative diseases, and certainly does in things like Huntington's disease, where you have excessive hydrophobic interactions between different proteins. So um, clearly an issue. Now, because this is such an issue, there are lots of ways that cells have of dealing with this. One of them is the so-called chaperones, and as I mentioned last time, um, this makes sure my daughters don't get involved with the wrong kind of people. Um, the idea here is you don't want incorrect interactions happening. And so that's really what chaperones do, is they block incorrect interactions. And in terms of proteins, that's usually hydrophobic regions that should not be interacting with each other. Uh, how do we know about these things? A couple of different ways. Viruses, of course, you know, the best way to know about anything. Um, the original mutants that were found in these chaperones were in proteins and actually genes that were found in E. coli that couldn't make viruses. And if you think about viruses, particularly the exterior part of, a part of a virus, the virion, it's these very complicated shapes that have to get put together, all kinds of different pr pieces of protein, et cetera. And so it's sort of the extreme example of why you have to be sure that all of the pieces fit together properly. And so not surprisingly, um, some of these virus assembly mutants were the first ones that were found and named again because of whatever the phenotype is. So GRO here, G-R-O, stands for growth. And so growth of the virus. So if you make a mutation, then these viruses don't grow. And we'll see what those are in just a second. The other times that you see these particular proteins is when you take usually an E. coli, but it turns out it works for us, it works for yeast, it works for all kinds of different organisms, even actually some of our organisms that we work with that grow optimally at 80 degrees Celsius, and you heat them up higher than the normal growth temperature, they have what's called a heat shock response, and they turn on or express a number of heat shock proteins. And it turns out a lot of these heat shock proteins are these chaperone proteins. Let's look at the two main classes of these. Um, they're known as either HSPs for heat shock protein, 
um, or the grow proteins for virus assembly, also known as HSP60s. We'll look at these grow mutants or the HSP60s first. These are the ones up on the top here. Here we have a HSP60, which basically is sort of two containers in the molecular biologists sort of think of it as containers of infinite dilution. So basically what you do is you put a non-properly folded protein, you isolate it from everything else, you close the lid, you shake it up, hopefully all the right interactions happen, you open the lid up, it comes out and it's a happy protein. Um, so that's the process and the lid here um, turns out to be an ATP dependent process, putting this lid on and taking the lid off. So ATP hydrolyzes, you have these interactions and finally you have the AND protein that comes back out here at the end. Um, a lot of the interactions that happen here are again hydrophobic interactions. You don't want the wrong hydrophobic interactions, you want the correct ones. In these HSP60s you can exchange these kinds of, of reactions. The other main class of HSP proteins are these here, the HSP70 proteins. These are ones that associate with proteins as they're being made by the ribosome. So again, particularly if you've got a protein that's got lots of hydrophobic parts to it, that protein is going to, if you're not careful, bind to other hydrophobic parts and you have a precipitated protein that's kind of a mess. If ever you have these heat shock proteins that associate with it, they will block the wrong kind of interactions and through cycles again of ATP hydrolysis allow the correct formation of this final structure. Um, and all of these are iterative processes, so you can have an incorrectly pro folded protein that gets partially folded that can go back and do this again. Same thing is true with these HSP70s. Why are they called 60 and 70? That's just because of the relative molecular mass of each of these proteins. So HSP60s are about 60,000 in terms of molecular mass and HSP70s are about 70,000 in terms of molecular mass. Just if you separate these on, um, uh, sorry, excuse me, SDS page, polymerized gel electrophoresis. Yeah. Yeah, so this, this is happening in the cytoplasm, but it also happens in um, all the different, if you think about a eukaryotic cell, it's got lots of subcellular components. It's also happening in some of those other ones, like the mitochondria, the ER, et cetera. So if there are complications with Yeah, so, so the, the question here is about what about hydrophilic side chains that might be incorrectly interacting? Usually hydrophilic um, side chains can be interacting with the water on the outside. And so it's very rare that those have particular problems and they're not likely to be aggregating with other bits. And so you think about hydrophilic parts of your protein, it's gonna be interacting with water. That's the interaction you want. You don't need a chaperone to take care of that. You don't you want to avoid those incorrect interactions. Yeah, back. <clears throat> okay, so the question here is where does that grow mutant basically come from? And why are we calling this grow? And it turns out it's grow EL and grow ES because they're larger and smaller proteins. So these are cellular mutants. So it's a cellular mutant that the virus can't grow on. And so that's the reason that they were called these in the first place. So they were looking at, you know, trying to find cells that were actually resistant to virus infection. And so how do you figure out that it's, it's resistant to virus infection and they only later found out what it did. A classic genetics experiment. Break something and then try and figure out what you broke. Okay, other questions on, on these guys? Yeah, over here. Yeah, so the, the question here is, are HSP70s interacting with peptides that are being formed co-translationally? And the answer is yes, 
if those proteins have hydrophobic regions which are coming off of them. If they're completely hydrophilic, and we mentioned again last time, as you obviously remember it well, um, is that some proteins just get made directly from the ribosome, don't need any of these chaperones at all. Yeah, there's a question over here too. Yeah, so grow L is the large, or the HSP60 part of this, um, and then the grow S is the smaller part. And why, getting back to the question earlier about, you know, how do we know about these grow mutants, it turns out there were two different grow mutants. At first they thought there was just one, and then they figured out that there were two different genes that were involved. Okay, so actually getting back to your question here, um, what about these different proteins. And so there are certainly a number of proteins that seem to fold perfectly happily in the absence of any of these chaperones. Um, and those are the ones, again, as mentioned earlier, that are usually being made co-translationally. So the peptide comes out of the ribosome, it folds up nicely, it's got its three-dimensional structure, it's active. And these um, arrows here are supposed to represent more or less the percentages of different proteins that are being made by any given ribosome. So about a third are correctly folded co-translationally. About a third are correctly folded with these different chaperones, and that can either be either co-translational, again, with the HSP70s, or post-translationally with HSP60s. Um, then, in eukaryotic cells, it's actually been about 20 and 30 percent that get incorrectly folded and have to be gotten rid of um, by the cellular garbage disposal, I call it here, the proteasome. And then there are a few, and these are the scary ones, which end up as protein aggregates, which can again cause these neurodegenerative diseases, et cetera. So let's look at this garbage disposal. The proteasome, um, again, ridiculous S numbers. You're going to hear there are too many of these different S numbers. Again, S just relates to where these things end up in a centrifugation run. So the 26S proteasome is the whole thing with the blue, yellow, and blue here set up with this middle portion and then two of these regulatory portions up here, which are 19S. So you know, how do you go from two 19s to 26? Again, you can't add S units, um, and they don't linearly scale with each other. But lots of people will talk about the 26S proteasome. And when you talk about the 26S proteasome, it means that it's the whole thing here. Um, and 19S is just this regulatory subunit right here. But the business end of the proteasome is this piece here, the yellow piece right in the middle because this has lots of proteases right in the middle of it. So the proteasome, is its job is to chew up proteins, and particularly unfolded proteins, or proteins that are somehow being targeted to be broken down. And because there are these lots of problems with protein folding, clearly the proteasome is a very important protein, or I should say a complex of proteins, um, and that, for that reason it's extremely abundant inside the cell. How does the proteasome work? It works because you have a protein that has a polyubiquitin chain on it. We talked about ubiquitination way back when at the beginning of the course. I'll cover it again really briefly here as review. But a protein that has multiple ubiquitins attached to it is going to be targeted to this regulatory subunit also called the unfoldase. It wasn't unfoldase too, it just unfolds proteins, um, and will feed these unfolded proteins into the garbage disposal, which will literally just chew up the rest of the protein here. Well, if you had all of your proteins getting chewed up all the time, this would be really bad. And as we talked about, again, before the midterm, translation is incredibly costly in terms of nucleotide triphosphate hydrolysis. So you only want to get rid of proteins if it's a really a problem. And so you want to be very specific about what gets degraded, and the way you get that specificity is through these um, polyubiquitin chains, which are formed. And this is you know, supposed to be sort of red lollipops represent these polyubiquitin chains. These ubiquitins are recycled. So once 
you have binding to this regulatory subunit of the proteasome, these ubiquitins are cut off and released and can go and be added again to a different structure. And the rest of the protein here, however, gets funneled into the garbage disposal and is de degraded. This is a reminder again where do you get these? Sorry. Yeah, sure. Yes, so this ubiquitin is conserved and reused. That's basically supposed to be shown down here at the bottom. You see this ubiquitin chain, little red lollipops. Um, the green protein gets degraded, but all of the red subunits are released, and so they can be used again. And so how do you get the ubiquitin associated with your protein in the first place? That's here. This is exactly the same picture that we looked at, lecture four, I think. Um, <clears throat> we have ubiquitin activating enzymes that pick up ubiquitin. Again, one of these things has been recycled after the proteasome has done its job. That gets put onto E2, which is your conjugating enzyme. And then the really important protein here is the E3 protein. This is your ubiquitin ligase. Ubiquitin ligase gives you the specificity, will interact with whatever protein needs to have ubiquitin added to it. In this case, it's a degradation signal. This is usually going to be some part of the protein that hasn't folded properly. Again, some extra hydrophobic piece that is really not good for the cell because it'll interact and aggregate if you don't get rid of it. So then you put this polyubiquitin tail on it. Or you can also have regulated degradation, which turns out to be really important for the cell cycle. And we talked about this really briefly when we talked about the regulation of replication initiation. So you remember CDT, CDC6, those get phosphorylated, but then also get degraded through this ubiquitination process. So there are basically two different ways you can get protein degradation. Either you turn on the ubiquitin ligase, the E3, various different ways of doing that. Phosphorylation. This is also what happens in the cell cycle. Cyclin-dependent kinases will also phosphorylate E3 proteins. You can also have a small molecule which binds to your E3 protein, or even have a different protein which associates with the E3 protein. And all that does is gives you a binding site for the appropriate substrate, which is going to be degraded. You can also do this on the other hand. It takes two to tango in this case. You need your ubiquitin ligase, but also you need the substrate. These substrates can be modified through, again, phosphorylation. You may have two proteins that associate. This one is blocking whatever that site is, this little bulge here at the end of your protein. Or in a number of cases, you actually have proteolysis that takes place. You have a protein that will have two domains. These get cut off between the two. One of the really nice things about this process is once you have a proteolytic cleavage that takes place here, now you have a free amino group. And as we mentioned before, and I forgot to remind you here, where does ubiquitin add to? Amino groups. So on lysines, proteins that are already there, or say lysines are already there in your protein, or at the amino terminus we can also then label with ubiquitin. So three processes here of making a good substrate for the ubiquitin ligase, which can lead to degradation processes. So finally, oh, sorry. Yeah, so the question is, again, just to repeat it so people here in the back, is there a race that's going on between the degradation process and the folding process? And the answer is most definitely yes. So if you, turn on, you end up making a whole bunch more of one particular protein and more than the cell usually would make, this is actually a huge problem that we have in molecular biology labs when we're trying to make extra proteins, is you end up with far too much of one particular protein, and all of this quality control mechanism just goes down the drain. Usually done in E. coli, which doesn't have the proteasome, but there are also similar kinds of proteases that do the same job. And so it, it is a big problem. So there's gonna be, it has to be a balance between these two.
And in fact, one of the things which people use and people are really excited about in terms of thinking about various drugs and particularly drugs for dealing with cancer cells that are rapidly growing is protease inhibitors and, and particularly proteasome inhibitors. So those actually seem to work in some chemotherapy drugs. Just by blocking that degradation pathway, you end up filling up the cell with these proteins that are no good and in that process um, end up killing the cell. So yes, yeah, definitely is a balance. It's, it's a very good point. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay, so <clears throat> we've gone from our DNA up here at the top. Just now we talked about protein degradation down here. Last time we talked about translation. Also on the midterm we talked about messenger RNA processing, some messenger RNA degradation that we'll get back to a little bit later on, particularly nonstop and nonsense decay, transcription, modification, and the initiation of transcription, which we have here. So this is what we've talked about so far. Now it's time to start talking about this aspect of things. So any questions about making the proteins in the first place? No? Yes? Do we all have our clickers with us? Good. Let's actually look at that question. That might actually be good. <laughs> uh, eh. Let's stop this so you can actually look at the question. That would be nice. Technology, I just love it. Um, OK, now we good? <laughs> Which of the following is most likely to have a direct protein ribosome interaction? HSP60, HSP70, the proteasome, E2 or E3? Vote early, vote often. Only the last one will count. And no, we don't have a paper trail. Maybe we should. Ten, five, I'm still aiming for this 100%, which we're not quite there yet. One of these days, one of these days, yes. Yeah, so it's HSP70, of course, because it's the co-translational process um, which is happening. OK, so now. Finally, we have to talk about regulation. Uh, this is, I keep modifying the first part of this slide, every lecture that I give, every year that I've been doing this. Um, so it's, first it was all about the DNA, and then it was almost all about the DNA, and now it's almost quotation marks all about the DNA. So one of the things that we've been learning literally in the I guess 16 years since I've been teaching this class, um, is that it's actually less and less about the DNA sequence and more and more about all the other things which are happening there. So <clears throat> all about the DNA and really about transcription. Again, we're going to spend most of our time talking about transcription and transcriptional regulation um, because you've gone from a whole genome, and all of us have more or less identical genomes relative to each other, but we're all different relative to each other. And we're different from the elephant versus the E. coli. Um, and is it just the DNA? Well, a lot of it has to do with which pieces of DNA are being made into active protein. And so there are lots of steps, as we just looked at, between that DNA being transcribed and the actual active protein. So I'll talk a little bit about DNA binding again. That's why I brought my model today. Um, and a couple of aspects about DNA binding that are very important. The vast majority of DNA binding proteins bind as dimers, so two different proteins that come together and then will bind to DNA, and we'll see why that is in a little bit. We'll cover the 
particular motifs, and this is why I spent so much time talking about domains and motifs way back when, again at the beginning of the class, is that these motifs are parts of proteins that will have a particular function, but by themselves are not going to fold and give you a stable structure. So they're bits and pieces of proteins, and mostly what we'll be concerned about here are going to be the DNA binding motifs, but also dimerization motifs, because most of these DNA binding proteins are dimers. Um, part of the reason that you have dimerization has to do with getting higher specificity. Two is definitely better than one because you have more sequence that you can interact with, um, but also in terms of cooperativity. And if we'll think about how you can have switches that turn on or turn off, usually you want to have genes that are turned on or turned off. You don't want them partly turned on at any particular time. And so this aspect of cooperativity, which has to do with dimers, et cetera, is really important in terms of turning things on and off. And then if we're talking about our kinds of cells, we have to deal with nucleosomes as well, which means that you already have DNA binding proteins associated with your DNA. How do you get your regulatory protein that you need associated with the DNA to associate the DNA when it's present in nucleosomes? So this is the sort of big question here, and they always like to take this example. You've had two cells in your body, and true for most of these mammalian cells, I say mammalian organisms, you'll have one cell, a nice small liver cell here, a neuron, which is absolutely ridiculously enormous, and these have the same DNA in them. So how do you end up with a fertilized zygote going into a liver cell or a neuron? And most of that seems to have to do with just which genes are turned on and which genes are turned off. And we now know a lot about this, partly because people have figured out how to reprogram cells to go from one to another, which is really pretty amazing. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, later on. But the take home message here is the DNA is the same, but the proteins are mostly really different. Some of them you'll find in all of these cells. And in fact, most of the proteins we've talked about so far, you're going to find in all these cells. Proteasomes you're going to find in all of these cells. Chaperones you're going to find in all of these cells. DNA polymerases, RNA polymerases, all these are the same. It's going to be the differences which are going to be particularly interested in making a liver cell a liver cell and a neuron a neuron. Um, the other thing with all of these proteins that are different between these different cells, those are then going to respond in different ways to different signals. So classic example is adrenaline. Okay, How is a liver cell going to respond to adrenaline versus how a neuron is going to respond to adrenaline? So the <clears throat> liver cells are going to pump out hormones and neurons are going to be stimulated. Okay, well there's two different things, two different responses to exactly the same signal. And this is also happening mostly at the level of proteins that are being made. So when I say DNA is almost all that it takes, why do we say this? And the basic reason that we say this has to do with cloning and Dolly and those cute little uh, macaques that I showed at the very beginning of class today. Um, you can take a nucleus from a already developed organism and put it into a egg that you've removed the nucleus from or destroyed it in one case and the nucleus that you put into this otherwise enucleated egg will give you what you started with up here in terms of the nucleus and not the egg that you had down here at the bottom. And this was done, you know, people all get up in arms about Dolly, et cetera, et cetera, but this is actually, these are originally done by the Gurdon lab in the 1950s. So it's actually been a really rather long time that we've known about this whole process of moving nuclei around. Um, but this process in terms of making Dolly and again the primates that I just mentioned again at the beginning of class today, um, it's taken a long time to get to the point that we can actually do this on a regular basis and have it work for animals and particularly for mammals and primates. Yeah? 
Ah, so the question is, does this process get around telomeres and senescence and so on and so forth? So it turns out that when you look at um, these particular, and we'll, we'll get back to this a little bit later on, but the cells that you use for this turn out to be very important. And skin cells are very interesting cells because they're growing all the time. And if you have a cell that's not growing, then a lot of those telomeres are going to be shrinking because you're not undergoing all this um, telomere act activity. So almost all the cells that you're taking these nuclei from have active telomerase and are actively have long telomeres. So yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good point. Is, you, know, you can do this with all cells. Well, it's not actually true. You can just only do this with a few of those cells, which again is getting back to the point that not all DNA in all cells is the same because they're going to have different length telomeres. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so well, we can talk, why don't we uh, hang, on, hang on to that thought for just a second. We'll get back to Dolly when we get, we get there in just a second. Okay, so it turns out to be hard for animals. It's really easy to do for plants. Oh, come on, let's move forward here. Um, and people, you know, clone plant cells all the time. Um, but again, it's usually the rapidly growing cells um, that are the ones which you can use to regrow plants with. And so um, plants are actually very easy to do this um, cloning process with. Um, then mammals, on the other hand, are, as it turns out, way, way, way harder to do this. So Dolly, um, who is up here, um, this is Dolly. This is Dolly's mom. Um, hopefully you can tell that they look very different relative to each other. I'm not very good at differentiating lambs from ewes. Uh, but <clears throat> they, were, um, they had different colorations of their fleece, and so it was really pretty straightforward to see the differences that were there. So this was 20 years ago that Dolly was first published, and you're exactly right. Um, the cloned animals did have a number of problems, but the big question was whether it had to do with the telomeres, whether it had to do with the cloning process, and as far as we can tell, there doesn't actually seem to be a big difference in terms of the cloning. Most of the animals which have been cloned seem to live relatively normal lifespans. Um, there was a whole discussion about Dolly at the beginning. You know, Dolly has arthritis and you know, much earlier, et cetera. Um, if you talk to people who know about sheep, they're like, oh, that's totally normal. That's exactly what you'd expect. So um, that's why I emphasize that I don't know very much about sheep. Um, so um, this is that whole idea here of the mammalian cloning process. Again, you have cells that are rapidly growing. In this case, it's usually epithelial cells from the oviduct. It doesn't have to be the oviduct, but again, rapidly growing cells, cells that are already turning over. You have a nucleus which is associated with each of these cells. You take this nucleus, you put it next to another egg, you zap it, and the zapping process, um, quite why you need to zap it is not clear at all, but if you don't zap, these things don't work. Um, and then you can have the fusion of these two cells, the nucleus here, the nucleus which has actually been literally removed in this case. So in the frog case, it was just inactivated the nucleus, but you actually have to take the nucleus out Taking the nucleus out of a, of a cell is a challenging process. When they did the original Dolly experiments, I think they had something like 200 um, donor cells, which they ended up having to try and use. And these were the you know, regular egg cells in order to get three, I think, lambs that came out. And one of those was actually the one that developed normally. So literally hundreds of eggs that have to be used to get one or two actual clones. So it's an incredibly expensive um, and rather difficult process to do. And then it took 20 years between getting Dolly to be cloned in sheep to the very first primate clones, which were literally announced in January, just uh, last month, in terms of these first macaque clones. Uh, this whole process is called somatic cell nuclear cloning. Why somatic cell nuclear cloning? Because these are somatic cells, which you've gotten here, and the nucleus is taken from those and added back to these eggs. There's another problem that you have if you do these kinds of experiments. What's the other problem you have with eggs? There's other genetic material in eggs, right? 
What's the other genetic material in eggs? Mitochondria, exactly. And so there are also potential issues with mitochondria, and now what people are doing, and particularly Shukrat Matalipov, who's out at the Primate Center um, here at OHSU, um, has been looking at various different ways of transferring mitochondria as well in some of these systems. And actually, it's now an approved process if the mother has a mitochondrial disease to get donated mitochondria from a different egg. And that seems to actually work reasonably well. Yeah? So do you test the nucleus? Yeah, so the question is, um, if you transfer the nucleus, do the mitochondria get transferred as well? No, they do not. And so it's just the nucleus which is being transferred. And so that can clearly be an issue here. Um, it's convenient because when you do the clone experiment, you can actually analyze the clone and see, oh, the mitochondria looks like the egg mitochondria, but the nucleus now looks like the nucleus you've gotten from the somatic cell in the first place. Yeah? So in the frog slide, they were using an EV to get, get rid of the nucleus. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the, the question is, why did they do UV in the frogs and they're not doing it now, just to paraphrase your question? Um, and I don't know. Um, I suspect that it's what worked. Um, and also, the microscopy and the techniques have gotten a lot better since the 50s to now. Um, and so the micro manipulation, all of the things that you can do with eggs. Another really nice advantage of frog eggs is they're big. Um, and so it's a lot easier to do some of these experiments with them. OK, so those are our clones. And so yes, the clones work, but we've got some issues, um, again, particularly things like mitochondria and potentially telomeres as well. But the fact that you actually can get a whole organism that does seem to actually survive reasonably well um, through this nuclear cloning technique means that it really is mostly about the nucleus. So what is it about the nucleus and then the different genes which are being made to go from this epithelial cell to a whole organism, how do you get from that one to the next? A lot of it has to do with the expression, and when I say expression, it just means transcription all the way through to active protein of any particular gene. But the easiest thing to look at, and as we'll see in just a second, probably the thing which is most regulated, has to do with <coughs> transcription. And so how do you look at transcription in this day and age? Basically, the way you look at transcription in this day and age is you get RNA from two different cells. And in this case, what do we have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven different cells. You collect the RNA from all of these cells, and you sequence it, because sequencing has gotten really cheap and really fast. And with all of those sequences, and since we know the human genome, you can take all of those RNA sequences and just line them up where they match anywhere in the human genome. And every time you have a match, you have a little dot right here um, that matches where you have in your transcription. And then the more sequences you have that match that particular space, that dot will get longer and longer, and you end up with a vertical line at that particular position. Now, this is literally millions of sequences of RNA that people have found in each of these different cells and then just said, where does this RNA match? And what you can see, hopefully, is that you have these bumps right where you have different exons that you have in your DNA sequence. So here's exon sequence, exon sequence, exon sequence, exon sequence. Introns you have much smaller amounts of here. There are also regions where you have, wait a minute, this is a sequence which is not coding for protein over here. We'll see what that sequence is important for later. But what this means is you have a messenger RNA, in this case for beta actin, which is present in pretty much any given cell that you look at. On the other hand, <clears throat> you have other genes which you find only in one particular kind of cell, liver cell, for instance here. Tyrosine amino transferase, the name of the gene here is not important. But here you have exon sequences that you find just in liver cells, but not in any other cells, 
maybe little bits of expression in these other ones, again, little small amounts of RNA in these other ones. And this may be some kind of contamination. It may actually be the fact that that sequence is so short, it only matches a particular repeated sequence that you're finding all over the place. So you have to see a relatively large amount of sequences to say, yes, this particular protein is being expressed in one particular case. And so look here, some genes, you've got RNA everywhere. Some genes, you only have RNA in a very small subset of cells. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, just the RNA. RNA is great, but what's actually doing the job? In most cases, it's proteins. So how do you look at proteins? It's actually a lot harder to look at proteins because a human genome, we've got a sequence. We can get our sequences of RNA. We see where it matches. That's easy to do. Proteins are a lot harder. Um, and there are lots of different ways of looking at proteins, but this is just one way of looking at proteins. It's what's called 2D electrophoresis. We'll talk about how this works right at the very end of class. Um, but basically, it's looking at all of the proteins that are being expressed in one particular tissue at one particular time. So it's looking at all of those different proteins. And so here we have all the proteins that are being made in brain and all the proteins that are being made in liver. And it's a whole bunch of dots. Anyone do Rorschach tests? You know, this is okay. What do these dots mean? Um, so you actually need pretty good software to isolate all of these different dots. And what this software has done here is it said, okay, anything which is in red is present in both of these cases. So these two dots right here, these correspond to these two dots right here. One thing that should be obvious is there's a whole bunch of blue. And the blues are now differences in proteins between these two different cells. And many of them, and the best example is the one right up here, <clears throat> you have multiple different spots here. Now, one of the things that I didn't mention is how you do these kinds of experiments. What you do is you separate proteins based on their relative mass here. So that gets back to the HSP60 and HSP70, HSP60, 60,000, HSP70, 70,000. And you also separate based on the isoelectric point. And how we do this again is something that we'll talk about later. But isoelectric point has to do with charge. And so you're separating based on size and charge. And if you have modified proteins, like you have here, with phosphorylation, what does phosphorylation do to your protein? It changes the charge. So if you've got multiple phosphates on one version of your protein, it's going to have a different charge than if you have one less phosphate and one less phosphate. We now know that all of these dots here actually represent one protein, but different amounts of phosphates that are on it. And this is a good description of the fact that you have not only different proteins, but awful different states of proteins, even in one particular cell or tissue type. Yeah. So the question is, why don't we see a diagonal line? Because adding a phosphate is going to change your molecular weight as well. Um, the, the thing is, there is actually, believe it or not, <laughs> a small line that you can see with these if you zoom in really, really closely. But the thing is, as I mentioned before, so if you think about HSP60, that's 60,000 Daltons. And I forget what the molecular mass is of a phosphate, but I think it's, well, the phosphate itself, or the phosphorus itself, is 32 plus four oxygens. You know, kind of do the math, but it's less than 100. And so you're not going to see that difference in these particular experiments. And that is actually a great lead-in to what people do these days. And did anybody make it to the biology seminar last week? Just me? OK, yes. So you saw the amazing proteomics that they did. Um, looking at all of the different peptides. And so one of the things that's happened, um, people used to do these experiments with these kinds of gels and get lots and lots of spots. Now what they do is they throw everything into a mass spectrometer. And since they have such high resolution, they can literally pick out millions of different peptides. So instead of hundreds of spots that you can get like this, you can get millions of different peptides. And then you can actually isolate exactly where your phosphorylation is. And that will change the mass. And that mass can be measured. And so people actually moving away from these kinds of 2D gels and more into mass spec. Part of the reason that I think they use this figure in our textbook is it's much more visual. If you, if you have a mass spec, all this is just a whole list of a table of all these different numbers of different masses. And that's a lot harder to look at. <clears throat>
But yes, very few people still do 2D gels these days. <coughs> okay, so what do I mean by you know, gene expression, um, all of these things? What we really care about is what's down here at the very bottom, active protein, because this is what's going to do the job. This is what's going to make the liver cell different from the nerve cell. It's going to make the amazing structures that you have in neurons that you don't have in liver cells, et cetera. And it starts with the DNA. We know that's the case. There's, you can clone all of these organisms with the DNA. And then various levels of control until you finally get to this very last active protein down here. The first step is really transcriptional control. And again, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about transcriptional control. Why are we going to start talking about transcriptional control? It's the first thing that happens. But also, if you don't turn on a gene, you don't have to go through all of these extra steps in order to finally get your active protein. So it's the energetically most um, appropriate place to do your regulation. Now, if you don't turn on transcription of a gene, you're not going to be hydrolyzing all the NTPs to do your transcription. You're not going to be going through all of the splicing that happens. You're not going to be worried about where your RNA goes. You're not going to be worried about degradation of your RNA. You're not going to be worried about degradation of your protein, et cetera. So from an energetically point of view, energetic point of view, excuse me, you want to really regulate at the transcriptional level. There's a problem, however, with regulating the transcriptional level. What is that? It's slow, exactly. It takes a lot of time between transcribing a gene, modifying the gene, exporting the gene, translating the gene, and then potentially even activating or inactivating a particular protein. So what do you do if you want to have a quick response? You want to be regulating over here. Level of activity, and very often this is going to be phosphorylation. It'll be GTP hydrolysis. Now you can have very rapid responses that are happening uh, at this particular end of regulation. And we're going to talk about regulation that happens at each of these individual steps. Um, there are reasons to have processing modifications. We talked about this in terms of alternative splicing. RNA transport and localization turns out to be really important for getting that development, getting differential expression in different parts of your organism, parts of an embryo. The amount of mRNA degradation, also very important for development. Translation, turning on translation, turning off translation. I talked a little bit about this before. It turns out that this is a much faster way to get to different amounts of protein, and particularly if you have messenger RNA in a particular part of the cell, turning on translation versus turning off translation is really important. And then, again, for this very rapid interaction, the protein activity control. And we've kind of talked about this already. We'll talk about the rest of these for the next, what, seven lectures or so. Uh, <clears throat> so any questions on what we've talked about so far? Is it time for me to do another clicker question? We're going to get 100% on this one? Yes? Which of the following kinds of gene regulation is most likely to be the most energy efficient in terms of NTP hydrolysis? Transcription control, mRNA processing control, RNA transportation control, translational control, or protein activity control? Come on, let's get 100% on this. Everybody get eight points, except for the two people who left already. <laughs> Ten, five, I should really try and find the people who are messing with my statistics. I really should. <laughs> so, but I won't. <laughs> or we can check and make sure that your clicker is, is working properly. Maybe it's gotten flipped over or something. So yes, it is a transcriptional control. If you know, energy efficiency, if you want to get energy efficiency, it's, it's, that's the time. That's, you really want to be regulating as early as possible 
in the whole process. <clears throat> okay, so just to finish up, I wanted to briefly introduce the DNA binding aspect, again, why I brought my model in the first place, uh, in terms of thinking about transcriptional regulation and why we care about transcriptional regulation, A, it's because it's the most energy efficient way to regulate gene expression. So uh, we often will talk about transcription factors, we talked about transcription factors last time. Before the midterm, those are the ones which are the general transcription factors helping the RNA polymerase to bind to promoters. Now we're going to start looking one step before that. How do you get the general transcriptions in the RNA polymerase to a particular promoter? This has to do with these transcription factors or gene regulatory proteins. About 10% of the genes in our genome code for these kinds of things. So they're very, very important and they're really what is differentiating between liver cells, nerve cells, epithelial cells, et cetera. The problem with studying these particular kinds of proteins is yes, they're 10% of the genome, but less than 0.1% of the actual proteins that are being made. So it ends up being really, really hard to study these. And if you think about those 2D gels that we looked at, the individual spots on them, it's the spots that you can't see. Those are the ones which are going to be these transcription or regulatory proteins. These transcription factors bind to intact double-stranded DNA, um, usually in the major groove. Why the major groove? Because that's where all of the chemical information is that tells you what the sequence is of the nucleotides which your particular protein is going to bind to. Most of these bind to what are called cis regulatory sequence. What I mean by cis regulatory sequence? Cis regulatory sequence means that the binding site for your regulatory protein is on the same piece of DNA and relatively near to what it's regulating. And we'll talk about what relatively near means um, a little bit later on. Um, these transcription factors are extremely specific. They are going to bind to very defined sequences in your DNA. They're not going to bind all over the place. They're not like nucleosomes that will bind pretty much to any piece of DNA. These are now going to bind very, very specifically to individual sequences. Again, why the major groove? Because this is where all of the chemical information is here. I don't expect you to remember the hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. I can't remember them myself, um, although you all know how to draw base pairs, so it should be pretty straightforward for them. But again, it's mostly the major groove where you're going to have interactions, but there is some chemical information in the minor groove, and we'll see for some of these proteins that they interact with a minor groove as well. But most of the specificity, i.e. binding to a specific sequence, is going to be interactions which are happening in the major groove of DNA. How do these uh, interactions take place? It turns out there are lots of different ways that interactions can take place. But very often, it's going to be hydrogen bonding interactions. So how are you getting hydrogen bonds? You have hydrogen bonds that are forming between the base pairs. But you also have hydrogen bonds that form between amino acid side chains and the base pairs, particularly those hydrogen bond donors and acceptors which are present in the DNA. And so here we have the example of one amino acid. Actually, let's try and move this, move this guy out of the way here. One amino acid, asparagine. Asparagine is really nice because it's got a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor that's associated with it. So it can interact with adenines here because adenine has a hydrogen bond donor and a hydrogen bond acceptor right next to each other. This can then as associate with asparagine. Somewhere else in your protein, you may have an arginine. Arginines have two of these amino groups, so they're going to be two hydrogen bond donors. So in this case, interacting with Gs in GC base pairs. These hydrogen bond interactions, again, going way back to what, lecture two, maybe lecture one, are very weak interactions. So all of these DNA binding interactions are very weak. How are you getting the interactions? It's many of these weak interactions. Many weak interactions will give you strong and specific interactions. And unfortunately, the interactions between each of these side chains and a particular base pair is rather difficult to predict. We're getting better at designing 
DNA binding proteins that will bind to specific places. And we may have a chance to talk about that right at the end of the course. These are things like zinc finger nucleases, et cetera, which are really important for genome engineering. Um, turns out that CRISPR-Cas is a way better way to do that. Um, so we'll talk more about that later. But the main issue here is that lots of side chains interacting with bases in the major groove, sometimes in the minor groove. And these are the kinds of things that we're still trying to figure out exactly how they interact. We'll see what progress has been made in that on our next lecture.